Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, she's faced the hardest times you can imagine. And you know, many times her eyes, they held back the tears. You know what I'm saying? Lord, no. Oh, but in her useful world, what well, was about to it was about to fall in, y'all. Cause each time her slender shoulders from the weight of all the fears. But inside no one hears. Still reigns a midnight silence in her ear. Wildflower by Newbirth. Cause she's a lady. It's a perfect song to start out this morning. For she is a child. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've taken about a minute and 15 seconds of your time because we have some information that we want to share with some of you. On this particular channel, I focus primarily on law now no 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 i don't focus on no stupid statutes no codes go back and take a look the law revision council writes the code law revision council has no constitutional authority to pen no code to rewrite the law because that's exactly what they've done now hold on now people say congress has the right to give them the authority to rewrite or codify the law. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on. Where is that written in the Constitution? No, 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 just go ahead and show me the authority in the Constitution that gives Congress the authority to give someone the authority to codify the law. Congress didn't get authority to write codes or to codify anything. Congress got the authority only presumably, to write law. Where did Congress get the authority to write law? Pay attention. Pay attention. Congress shall make no law. Because the First Amendment, the very first five words of the First Amendment is Congress shall make no law. Pay attention. Because it says that, pay attention. It is presumed that they have the authority to make law. It's not written anywhere. Now, most of you don't know, when the Constitution was put together, the people were involved. It wasn't just uh, the delegates and all of that making up whatever they wanted to, going according to their conscience. No, the people told them, this is what we want. There were town hall meetings where people chimed in and the majority won out. And then they took that majority vote they, they want to try to call it the popular vote. It has nothing to do with popular. Oh, yeah, they're so popular. Yeah, they're number one on the charts. It has nothing to do with popular. It has everything to do with the people's wishes. As I've explained to you all. Hey, hey, new birth. Y'all hold on a second. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, as I've explained to all of you, some of you will pay attention, some of you won't. But as I have explained, the way the law works from the very beginning, the people are the ones who ordained the Constitution. It wasn't Congress who ordained the Constitution. It was the people. Now, hold on, just so that some of y'all know. When the Constitution was first penned, the delegates took the wishes of the people back to Pennsylvania, that was the capital at the time. When they took the wishes of the people back to Pennsylvania, they had to give their vote according to the wishes of the people, not according to the wishes of their conscience, what they thought was best. The people did not put their faith in no stupid congressmen or no stupid delegates. I know. So when we have this thing called the Electoral College, that was created by Congress. That was to take power away from the people. Go ahead. 
The first ten amendments were ordained by the people. All that other junk that came afterwards, go ahead and see if the people had any say so. Go ahead. I dare you. So, that you understand. There is no law authorizing Congress to give anyone else the authority to write law. The Law Revision Council, oh, that was created by Congress and the Senate. No, it wasn't. That's a corporation. It has its own EIN number, which means it's under the executive branch. It's even run by lawyers. Executive branch. Okay, let me explain this so that you guys get it. Just because someone has a law degree doesn't mean that they know law. It just means they know, they know policy and procedures. Go ahead. Go ahead and see if these <clears throat> intelligent creatures do not, while in law school, argue cases and opinions. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not law. The study of the law is the understanding of how laws are created and then how the wording of the law is applied. People say it's left up to interpretation. You cannot interpret the law. That's why they have general principles of statutory interpretation. There are certain principles that must be followed when writing the law. So it's not up to the Supreme Court or anybody else to interpret the law. There is no law giving the Supreme Court or anyone else the authority to interpret the law. Who gave the Supreme Court the authority? It gave itself that authority in Madison versus Marbury. Go back and look at the case. Go back and look what the Chief Justice had to say on that day. I was listening to an MSNBC report yesterday about the leak of the Roe v. Wade uh, decision by the Supreme Court. I don't need to know who leaked it. All I need to know is when the Supreme Court made their decision, they were on the money. Not because they were advocating abortion, not because they weren't advocating abortion. It's the same principle they used when they said that same-sex marriages were not unconstitutional. They didn't say they were constitutional. They said they were not unconstitutional because all men are created equal. That's what the Constitution's declaration says. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Ladies and gentlemen, in the entire existence of existence, only one man has ever been created. All other men are procreated. Even Jesus, when he was placed into the womb of the woman, was procreated for the purpose of being here. Only one man was ever created. Only one woman was ever co-created. I didn't say pro, P-R-O, I said co-created. Why? Because it was a rib from man which started the foundation of woman. That's why she is called womb man. If you don't understand, woman is simply a male with a womb. So although there's a lot of confusion out there, as to what constitutes a man and what constitutes a woman, the word explains what constitutes a man and what constitutes a womb man. Lord have mercy. Oh, and you can't surgically place a womb on a man and now say he's a woman. <laughs> That's unnatural. Okay. I'm not here to have that debate because that's what people want to do. I'm here to only talk about logic and the law. Now, I know, I know there are going to be people out there saying, well, logic says it, and then you can kiss my, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> sorry, had, whew, had to let that one go because I will go there. Now, ladies and gentlemen, from time to time I do consults, and the consults, a lot of people are mistaken that the consults are designed for me to teach them how to do something, like how to get rid of their debt, or how to create this, and how to create that. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not what a consult is for. Just because I talk about many subjects doesn't mean that I'm going to spend an hour and a half teaching you about it. I talk about it on video. 
the consult is, you let me know what your situation is, what your problem is, and I will give you more than five separate legal and lawful options in order to resolve it. I'm going to give you guys another little gem. Not a John? No, a gem. But why not a John? Because a John is where most of you go and think. Gems are where you go to exercise. Okay? So we're going to give you all another little gem. If you have a Truth in Lending Act statement associated with your promissory note, you have it if you have a student loan, you have it if you have a car loan, you have it if you have a so-called home loan, even if it's a refinancing. Now, for the most part, pay attention, a refinancing and a home loan are misnomers. Pay attention. Your loan, the financing was over. Go back and look at Federal Reserve Operating Circular number 10, appendix number 3. Look at the title. It says, Application Packet for U.S. Borrowers. Then the very next line talks about you, a U.S. borrower, petitioning the Federal Reserve for the capacity. That's right. It's all about capacities, the simple, bare capacity. Anyway, the capacity to borrow money. Well, if you go look at Section 16, of the Federal Reserve Act, paragraph number two and four, only Federal Reserve banks can borrow money from the Federal Reserve. So you are petitioning them for that capacity. That's why they have those closing papers where you have to sign all that stuff where you're surrendering so many rights to the local Federal Reserve agent. Don't worry about that. Let that be. Getting back to the Truth and Lending Act statement. Truth and Lending Act statement says they loaned you credit. Well, that's not a home loan. They're loaning you credit. They're not loaning you a home. Go back and take a look. Ladies and gentlemen, if it was a home loan, what they would be doing is giving you the home and you would be paying back the value of the home. But that's not what's happening. They are lending you credit. How are they lending you credit? Well, they tell you you've been approved. Section Paragraph 4 of Section 16, you've been approved, and because they've approved you for the loan, they tell you go find a home. And when you find a home and there's a seller, what do they do? They pay the seller what, what is called an extension of credit. Because they've given the seller those credits, which is on the Truth and Lending Act statement, you now have agreed to pay them back that value of those credits. Ta-da! Just that simple. However, that makes it a consumer credit transaction and not a consumer loan transaction. Pay attention now. Consumer credit transactions are not foreclosable. Now, there'll be some, many of you guys won't know how to argue this in court, but there'll be some attorneys that will challenge that, and they cannot. Because a consumer credit transaction only involves credit. The bank didn't loan anything of value. So they're not losing anything. So they took no risk. Pay attention. So because they took no risk, it's not foreclosable. Not, but hold on. Even if they said it was, the collateral was the promissory note according to the law. Not according to your thinking, according to the law. The law must be followed as written. So you take your consumer credit transaction document known as the Truth and Lending Act statement, and you simply tell them, hey, uh, you see this right here? This says that was loan credit. And then you quote the sections where it says for the credit that was loaned to you, the amount of the credit that was loaned to you. You take those little sections that talk about the credit, and you quote it, and you send them a letter. I need y'all to send me my authenticated record of accounting because I need an authenticated record of accounting. Now, I'm authenticating. I don't owe y'all, <coughs> excuse me, I don't owe y'all jack, <coughs> okay? And because I don't owe y'all jack, y'all are in the wrong. You send a letter once, send a letter twice, send a letter three times, 14 days apart. You're creating an administrative process, paperwork. That's all you're doing. You keep all this stuff together in one file. 
and you get a copy, tell them I need y'all to send me a copy of the promissory note, but I'm going to need a certified copy from y'all to make sure that it's coming for you because anybody can, you know, copy a document. I need a certified copy of the promissory note. They, don't, they ain't going to like that, but you want to get a certified copy. You're not going to be endorsing and nothing like that. You can take the certified copy, you're going to put that in the file. Then you're going to take this file that you just put together, you're going to go to Small Claims Code. Because remember, they ain't going to give you your authenticated record of account. Authenticated record of accounting means it must be signed, authorized. Tell them, I want it signed and authorized by somebody who has experience in accounting, who is qualified to give an authenticated record of accounting. That's it. That's all you're asking for. You have a right to that because it's a credit transaction. Truth and Lending Act says you have a right to this. All right? Consumer Protection Act says you have a right to this. You got me? After you do all of that, then you go down to the small claims court, you know, the people's court. Judge Wapner didn't call it the people's court for no reason. Small claims court is the people's court. Why? Because the people don't know legalese. <laughs> people don't know that junk. So you ain't got to practice none of that legalese stuff. Uh, wherefore, thou and thou. You, know, you ain't got to go back to no King James version of no. Nah, ah, just go up in there. Fill out the paperwork. Go over the basic rules of the court. And sue them for violations of the Truth and Lending Act. Go to ChatGPT. Put the scenario in ChatGPT and say, what are the potential violations of the Truth and Lending Act? And then go look at those potential sections of the Truth and Lending Act and see if they apply. And only use three of them at a time. Three. Why three? Because when you sue them specifically, for those three sections, and you if you lose, you get to go back into small claims court. Pay attention now, and you get to sue them for the other sections that you didn't list. What, what you talking about? If I lose, you mean I can go back into court again? That's right, as long as you're not going back into court on the same thing. Now, the judge will say, pay attention. Judge will say, no, you are barred because you sued them under the Truth and Lending Act. No, I did not. I sued them under the sections of the Truth and Lending Act. I did not sue them for the whole entire Truth Lending Act. Now, you can go back to your own case citations and you'll see that if I did not sue them specifically under this section, I reserve the right to sue them under this section if I so choose. So don't you dare sit up here and tell me what I can't do, mother, <coughs> excuse me, your, 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 your barner, okay? Now, let's say you lose the second time and the third time you bring your claim. And you want to sue for the maximum amount, damages and everything. You want to sue for the maximum amount. Don't worry about explaining anything. Just demand that they show proof of accounting in that courtroom. Now, each one of your states have a commercial code. You're looking for the one that corresponds, the commercial code for your state that corresponds to UCC 9-210. So all you got to do is go to Google. UCC 9-210 then the name of your state, and it will tell you the code for your state, okay? That's what you're looking for, because that's what you're suing them under, the commercial provisions of law. Now, hold on. Let's say you done went in there three times, and you done lost all three times because you don't know what you're doing, because you're just so nervous, and you're making mistakes, and you're trying to add all that other junk that ain't got nothing to do with the case, enter the case, and the judge is kicking your stuff out because he thinks you crazy, because he said you crazy, and you act like you crazy because you're not listening to me. Then what you do is you go in under the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act. FACRA, F-C-R-A, Fair Credit Reporting Act. Now, there are several sections. We're going to give you the basic ones. You're going to give them... Section 604, 605, 606, 607, 609, 611, 613, 615. You're going to give them those basic ones, but like I said, you're not going to use all of them at once. I <laughs> know you got to go over them first. And now you go in under the FACRA, FCRA, Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act. Different penalties because they're reporting falsely an inaccurate accounting to the credit reporting agencies. The accounting that they report has to be accurate, like accurate. Just that simple. 
All right. Now, for our people, the people who come to our organizations to get assistance, Amera Legion and um, AMCF, what we do is we help create their tax credits and we help create a record for them. That's what we've done. We've created a record. That record has generated notary presentment and so many other things, more than 25 different documentations that a person brings into court and shows. Now, look, let me backtrack for a second. The small claims court is how I got my start. That's how I paid my rent for the first seven years after I left home. Okay? By suing corporations in small claims court. Yeah, it was a living. But I also learned a lot because I was in small claims court. By the time 2004 came around, I was 86% of cases won with going to and from court. 86%. Then the court started blocking me, <laughs> especially the federal ones. They started blocking everything because I started hammering them with their secrets and putting their secrets on a record. So you'll find most of the cases are sealed, including the one against the SEC because I put their secrets on the record. I keep doing that because I, I don't know no better. <laughs> you know, they tell me to stop and I'm like, kiss my, <laughs> excuse me, uh, Newberg, come on back. And so, ladies and gentlemen, with that being said, the small claims court is nothing to be afraid of because I got started in small claims court at the age of 17. Small claims court started in California. Okay. When small claims court came about, there was all kind of commercials, TV, and everything. And I said, I'm going to try it. They said it was simple. And I, man, then in 2002 and 2003, I was going before the small claims court. And there was a judge. His name was Judge Stevenson. The Judge Stevens, not Stevenson. Judge Stevens. Judge Stevens, I had been before many times because it was small claims court. Anyway. And Judge Stevens, we're in the process of evicting some people. And I, I got a building of eight units I got to evict. We evicted everyone but one person. I allowed him to stay because he had been there the longest. He was older. He didn't cause no problems. He paid his rent on time. No big deal. Everybody else who hadn't paid their rent, y'all got to go. Kick them out. And, but, 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 but we didn't hold them liable for the past rent. We did not go after their credit. We let them go, free and clear. They agreed, they accepted it, but there was this one that was gonna fight us. Then the court, we went to court, got all my paperwork together, the same type of paperwork that we're preparing for our clients. And I presented that to the court. What well, do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have proof of this? You have proof of that? I said, yes I do, here it is. Yes I do, here it is, everything was already in files, already ready, and I just handed it to the judge. And Judge Stevens said in front of everybody, this is the beginning, this is the beginning, we're, we're the first set of cases. I, I have seven cases before him. And he says, I don't know of an attorney that could have done a better job than what you have done here this morning. I said, thank you, Judge Stevens. And he says, okay, I rule in favor of the blah, blah, blah. I'm the plaintiff. And I said, okay, have a good day. Grab my paperwork and my friend that's standing next to me who I'm representing. I'm the manager, so I'm representing his interests. <laughs> okay, yes, I got to represent him in court. I was the manager. I was the one who brought the suit. I had the authority to do so. And he puts his hand on my shoulder. He had a habit of putting his hand on my shoulder. He's six foot nine. So he had a habit of putting his hand on my shoulder. And he's like, man, did you hear what he just said to you? Like what? He said that he doesn't know of an attorney that could have done a better job. And I told him, I said, yeah, that's just Stevens. And I just went on about it. Well, I didn't, it didn't have any meaning to me back then because it was just a normal thing. And I say it today to all of you that all of you get to have that very same thing being said about you if you document and record everything according to the rules. Now, I think this is Casey and JoJo. Who, who be this? It, it ain't Shirley. 
or is this Drew Hill? It could be it's, it's somebody. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't know who this is. It's, it's I don't want is what it's called. I don't know who it is, y'all. Because I've been doing Jagged Edge, Drew Hill, Mint Condition, and, 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 and y'all know what I mean, uh, and, 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 and the new birth. So I've been doing a whole lot of people. That's on my phone. Use YT3 to download and create my music list. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, this sounds like Jodeci. But I can't tell because, you know, they put those groups together so that they all sound alike because they were going for that. Pay attention. Sound. All right, getting back to the conversation, the Truth and Lending Act statement is your best friend. Why is the Truth and Lending Act statement your best friend? Because the Truth and Lending Act statement says that you weren't loaned money, you were loaned credit, which means the bank took no risk. But for lending you that credit, that extension of credit, it was a what's called a provisional credit because they used that to pay the seller, which made technically you liable for repayment. However, when you signed the paperwork at closing, which incorporated the so-called application packet, then you satisfied your obligations under the Federal Reserve Act because the contract is incorporating the Federal Reserve Act. What did the Federal Reserve Act say? Federal Reserve Act says, get the, up my face. That's what the Federal Reserve Act says with anybody who claims that you don't have the right. Okay? Let me see if I can explain it to you this way. Federal Reserve Act says when you do it that way, your note operates as collateral and security. So if the note is the collateral, they have no claim. But guess what? You're in small claims court. You don't care about whether or not there's a debt owed. It ain't about whether or not there's a debt owed. It's about whether or not there's a violation of the Truth in Lending Act. That's all it's about. Did they send you the accounting like they were required to under the Truth in Lending Act? Have they properly reported the debt? Have they properly reported a verified debt? No, they haven't. That's what you're suing them for in small claims court. You're not worried about whether or not there is a debt. You're worried about the accounting. Go back and look at UCC 9-210. That's how you're going to hammer them and hit them in the head. Now, go back, listen to this again and again until you get the procedures down. And then start taking care of your business, ladies and gentlemen. It's a new year. It's a new year. So start the new year off by getting some act right. That's what we call it. We call it getting some act right. If somebody ain't doing what they're supposed to do, then you got to tap that anus so that they start acting right. Some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. So again, Keep hitting them in the head until they start acting right or until you get to the white meat, whichever one comes first. That's all you're doing. Okay. Now, this is information that we're, that I'm giving you guys free of charge. Go ahead. Knock yourselves out. But for our people, we've already done the paperwork for them and they're about to get the whole steps they need to take and so on and so forth. All right. So I got to let y'all go because I got to go get to that stuff. Because uh, you got to deal with our car people, our student loan people, our home loan people. You know, we got to deal with everybody. So we're going to let y'all go. Got to go, got to go, got to.